This is the list of rum that is sold in the state of Utah. This is the full list of light rum, white rum that you can buy in Utah, the kind of rum you use to make a daiquiri. It's an okay list. It's not great if you're a big rum fan, but I gotta tell you, it is better than the Mezcal list. Look, this is all the Mezcal that you can get in the state of Utah. That's it, those two, legally. E even though one of, the, one of the two Mezcals you can get apparently has illegal as its brand name, this is all that you can legally get as far as it goes mez Mezcal uh, in the state of Utah. However, um, if you have a kind of rum or a kind of Mezcal or even a label of wine that you would like to be able to get but that isn't on the Utah state list, you can request it from the state government. If you click on the little shopping cart there on their website, it takes you to the special orders page where you can ask your state government to please buy you some better Mezcal or whatever. You have to ask them though. They do try to be helpful. There's a whole section of the state government's website about uh, how to best pair the wines of the state of Utah with various types of food. And this is not like a tourism thing. This is not an export thing. This is not just wines made in Utah. It's wines from everywhere, but the state has to get them for you. It used to be that there was a state employee in Utah whose job it was to taste every alcohol, every wine, every whiskey that the state was considering allowing into the state to be sold. I don't know if there still is someone who has that job, but it wasn't that long ago. It's because in Utah, the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control is not only tasked with enforcing liquor laws in the state, doing things like giving out liquor licenses, they also choose which wines and beers and spirits the citizens of the state of Utah may purchase. The state government, on behalf of its residents, tastes wine and decides if it is good enough for Utah. The way that the states deal with booze is really weird. I've always thought that it's mostly because we had a long, strange, national failed experiment called Prohibition that was not all that long ago, from which we really haven't quite totally recovered. When Prohibition ended in 1933, Americans could legally buy and sell and drink booze for the first time in 13 years. And people were obviously psyched when Prohibition ended, but there was a lot of policy to figure out in terms of how the country was going to sell and regulate alcohol. Would cities do it? Would states do it? The federal government? Should you have to apply for a license to sell alcohol? How old should you have to be in order to drink alcohol? States came up with their own answers to those questions, and the laws between the states, even all these decades later, are still really diverse. Today, for example, 18 states are called control states, which means they control the wholesale and, in most cases, retail sales of alcohol. That's why in a control state like Utah, the state chooses your wines for you and hopefully will help you pair them with your dinner. Weirdly, the state of Maryland is not a control state, but there is one county in the state, Montgomery County, that does it that way too. A little, little, a little taste of Utah in the middle of Maryland. The heterogeneity um, on these issues isn't just between places that have state stores for booze and states that don't have state stores. I mean, in some places you can buy beer or wine or even the hard stuff at your average Rite Aid or your average gas station. In some places you can buy beer at a gas station, but spirits have to come from one of those state stores that looks like a prison, right? There, there are all of these different levels of control on the sale and distribution of booze, up to and including the state becoming the retailer that sells you the booze. And now that is about to happen with pot, too. Sort of. Um, three states had wide-ranging new rules about pot on the ballot this year. Not about medical marijuana, but just about recreational use of marijuana. Uh, the measures passed in Washington and in Colorado, but not in Oregon, which is in interesting given that Oregon is an even more blue state than Colorado is. But Oregon was voting on something slightly different. The model of the, the state-run store that sells all the liquor in the state, the Utah model, right? That is what Oregon was considering for pot. The idea that the state would regulate people growing pot, regulate people processing it, like drying it and packaging it and getting it ready to be sold. And in Oregon, the proposal was that the state itself would buy all of the pot in the state and then sell that pot to Oregon residents, presumably at stores that look like prisons, like they do with whiskey in North Carolina and Utah and a bunch of other states too. That model of how to deal with legalized pot is what was rejected in Oregon this year. But what was accepted in Colorado and Washington State, on the other hand, was a proposal that the states, those states should license and regulate people to grow marijuana, license and regulate people to process it and prepare it for sale. But then, in Colorado and Washington, what they said is that the state should also regulate normal businesses, private for-profit stores to operate like regular liquor stores, like regular businesses, selling this newly legal product that will be regulated and taxed by the state. 
That is the proposal that won by 10 points in Colorado and by 12 points in Washington state. According to these ballot initiatives, it will not be illegal to buy or possess less than an ounce of pot if you're over the age of 21. So on paper, at least, the idea is that pot will now be regulated much the same way that alcohol is. But the really important difference is, the really important difference is, that according to the federal government, and therefore for the whole United States of America everywhere, according to the federal government, it is still illegal to possess or buy or sell pot. And that is just as much the law as these new state laws are that say quite the opposite. So what's going to happen here? Is it legal or not? Is it going to be legal to buy and sell and smoke pot in Colorado and Washington, or is it not? We are not the only ones asking this question. The people in charge are asking this question, too. The governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, has indicated that he also has no idea how this is going to work. On election day, he put out a statement reminding Coloradans that under federal law, pot is still illegal, and so Colorado residents should hold off on the Cheetos and Goldfish for the time being. In Washington state, the outgoing governor there, Chris Gregoire, met with the federal deputy attorney general today to try to figure out how this is going to be handled, this direct conflict between federal and state law. Meanwhile, prosecutors in the two largest counties in Washington state have taken matters into their own hands. They have dropped hundreds of cases of pot possession in that case. Hundreds of criminal cases have been dropped. The King County prosecutor says there's no point in continuing to seek criminal penalties for conduct that will be legal next month. True enough. However, in the same state, out in the eastern part of Washington state, in Spokane County, prosecutors there say they plan to keep arresting people just as they do now for pot-related offenses. Their argument out in Spokane is that the only legal way to get pot in Washington, even after this new state law goes into effect, will be to buy that pot from a state-regulated pot store. And those state-regulated pot stores don't exist yet. But they might soon be created if the federal government allows that to happen, and nobody knows that the federal government will allow that to happen. This is policy soup, and I do not mean that as a munchies joke. We've all had enough of those. This just literally does not make any sense yet. Joining us now for the interview is Neil Franklin. He's the executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He served in law enforcement for 30 years as a narcotics officer with the Maryland State Police and as commander of training for the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, Mr. Franklin, it's very good to have you here tonight. Thanks for joining us. Rachel, thanks for having me. What a great lead in. Oh, let me ask you first. You are more familiar with these laws than I am. Did I, did I basically get the contours of that right? Do you feel like the comparison with alcohol prohibition is appropriate here? Absolutely. It, it is appropriate. It was the states back in 1933 that ended alcohol prohibition. They were the ones that took the initiative to move the federal government towards change. You are a supporter, I know, of the decriminalization of marijuana. Um, with your background in, in law enforcement, specifically working in narcotics law enforcement, how did you, how did you come to this political point of view? Well, it, it didn't happen overnight, but there was one key moment uh, back in 2000, October. Um, I had just retired from the Maryland State Police the year before, went to work for Baltimore Police Department as a commander of training. And a good friend of mine and comrade, Ed Totley, was working undercover for the Maryland State Police. He was assigned to an FBI task force in Washington, D.C., and he was buying drugs from a mid-level drug dealer. This time, the drug dealer decided that he wanted to keep both the mug, drugs and the money, and he executed uh, Ed Totley right on the spot. He shot him in the side of the head. Mm. And uh, that made me start to think. I thought back to Marcellus Ward, who was working undercover for the Baltimore Police Department when I was back in the 80s. He was killed in a similar manner. A um, couple officers in Baltimore City were killed right on the street by drug dealers. But then, just a couple years after Ed Totley's assassination, the Dawson family of seven right here in Baltimore were murdered one night by a drug dealer who occupied the corner right outside their home. The mother was working with the police, being a good citizen, and he set their home on fire early one morning because he disagreed with her interfering with his marketplace. That was my turning point. When you talk to people who disagree with you on this issue, when you try to make the case for decriminalization, how do you explain why incidents of violence like that that you've lived through, people that you know and have worked with and have seen as colleagues who have died in the line of fire in this war on drugs, how do you make the case that decriminalization would get rid of that sort of horrific violence? 
Well, let's be clear, not decriminalization, because all that does is remove the criminal penalty from possession. You still would have your uh, illicit trade, the drug dealers on the street, the yeah. cartel in Mexico. Legalization with regulation and control is what we want to do. We want to move, remove this completely from the hands of criminal gangs and the cartel. That will affect the violence. That's when the violence goes down. In terms of what's been uh, just approved by the voters in, in Colorado and in Washington state, it seems unclear to me now what's going to happen in these states where state law is in opposition to federal law. How do you think that law enforcement uh, is going to handle this? And ultimately, is this a decision that's made at the political level or at the law enforcement level? Well, it's, it's made at both levels. And I think this is a win-win for police. In Seattle, the police chief has already said that they're not going to arrest people for possession of marijuana anymore, even though the law doesn't take effect until December. It's a win-win because it has been drug prohibition, like with marijuana, that has driven a wedge in between police and community. Number one, police can get back to the business that they want to do, of what they want to do, and that is to protect people from violent people. Rape, robbery, murder, crimes against our children, domestic violence, we can get back to the business of that. We didn't, most of us didn't sign on this job to arrest people for smoking pot. It will repair, it gives us an opportunity to repair the damage that has been done between police and community. You know, racial profiling, the foundation for racial profiling today in this country is the drug war. And the drug war just doesn't work anymore. There's not one piece of it that works. We have more drugs in our community than ever before. It's very costly, four decades, $1.3 trillion. Our prisons are bursting at the seams, mainly with black and brown people. We need a change, and it's time for the president to lead on this one. Neil Franklin, executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, uh, a three-decade-long career in law enforcement. Uh, sir, thank you very much for your time tonight. You speak with uncommon authority on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. All right.